Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, welcome to this um, event um, on Ebola and emerging infectious diseases. Uh, my name's Alison Holmes. I'm a professor of infectious diseases at Imperial College, and I'm also an infectious diseases consultant and responsible for infection control. The um, event this evening um, uh, follows the recent outbreak of Ebola virus in West Africa, and we're delighted to have this expert panel with us tonight um, who will be able to discuss the threat of emerging infectious diseases and the risk that emerging infectious diseases pose in a, in a globalized world. Um, we are hoping that they'll consider the ways the international community um, deals with infectious diseases and particularly the challenges of, um, for control and prevention. So we just want to note that the event will be held on the record. Um, the audience um, can comment on the event via Twitter if you'd wish to, and that is um, hash CHE events, and you can even pose questions if you want via Twitter, which is hash ask CH. Um, if I could just double check that you've all turned your mobiles off and or they're on silent, that would be wonderful. We can have a quick rustle around and check now. That would be absolutely brilliant. Um, the panel have done that as well. Um, and um, what I'd like to do now is um, introduce our speakers. So we've got, um, next to me, we've got um, Professor David Heyman, who is Professor of Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he's also the head of the Global Health Security at, um, here at Chatham House. Next to him, we have Richard Smith, who is our health economist from um, the London School of, of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and is a professor of health economics and has got enormous and extensive experience in health economics. Next to him, we have Osman Dar, who's a physician and a, um, um, who's also trained in public health, who also is a, uh, a research fellow at Chatham House on the global, um, in, in global security. And lastly, from MSF, we have Armand Sprecher, who is, um, who is um, as I say, with MSF, and he's an emergency um, physician and an epidemiologist who has hands-on experience with the um, Ebola outbreak and extensive experience um, in, in dealing with such outbreaks, as well as a background in health informatics. So, thank you very much, speakers. And what we're going to do is have around five minutes from each of them, and then <coughs> open um, the event up for questions. So, I'm going to start with David. Thanks, Allison. What I'd like to do is take you back to 1976, to the first outbreak of Ebola. I'd like you to picture a, a rural hospital in West Africa, which was run by a group of B Belgian sisters and, and fathers who were running this mission. A strange infectious disease, or thought to be infectious disease, entered the hospital one day, and immediately um, there was panic in the area because not only did patients begin dying who had the disease, but some of the healthcare workers died. In fact, 13 total died. And the outbreak stopped when the hospital was closed. Because a characteristic of Ebola outbreaks is that their transmission is amplified in hospital settings where practices are not preventing infection. And this is what happened in the outbreak. In fact, the first case was thought to be a, a headmaster of the school at the mission who bought an animal in a market, took it home, butchered the animal. He became sick a few days later, was seen in the outpatient department. There were four needles and syringes in that outpatient department. They were not sterilized between use. He was given an injection. Those needles and syringes also went into the maternity ward in the hospital, and the patients in the maternity ward also became infected because they were injected with these needles and syringes. So an outbreak that shouldn't have occurred that occurred because of poor hospital practices. This is common of emerging infectious diseases in general, which is what Ebola is. Ebola was maybe the first iconic, if you would, disease that's an emerging infectious disease. These diseases are diseases that come from animals into humans. They breach the species barrier. They infect humans. And there's one of three things that can happen. They can infect a human and go no further, such as rabies. They, they're breach the barrier, they infect a human, they cause disease, but they go no further. Another is like Ebola or like avian influenza, which breaches the barrier, infects people in close contact, but doesn't go on. 
The third type of emergence is one that emerges and then becomes endemic. And the best example of this is the tragedy of HIV, which emerged from a non-human primate sometime at the beginning of the 20th century and then became an endemic human disease throughout the world. These are the three pathways. But whatever pathway they take, emerging infections cause human suffering and death. And that is whether it's an, a disease that we know or don't know, such as Ebola or SARS, or a resistant infection which can act in the same way, an infection that's resistant to antibiotics. So we see emerging infections occurring at the animal-human interface. And the difficulty with these is threefold. Number one, they cause sickness and human suffering. Number two, they cause death. And number three, they cause a severe economic impact in many instances. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll move on to our health economist. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So clearly my perspective is economics is important in this for a whole range of reasons, but I just want to pick three just to give you a, a flavour of the breadth here and uh, maybe get us some discussion later. First is infectious disease, as, as David said, whether that's uh, Ebola or SARS or HIV or malaria, is going to have an economic impact. And often that economic impact is going to be far greater than the health care impact. So uh, whether that SARS being estimated at 30 billion BSE, 40 billion cost to the UK economy, uh, antimicrobial resistance potentially could be trillions if it devastates the health systems that, that are based on these drugs. What's important is not just the size of that economic effect, and that will differ according to methods and the usual things you'd expect, but also that it hits different areas of an economy. So David, for example, mentioned uh, uh, animals, and of course One Health is very involved there with agriculture. So agricultural health and human health are very closely linked uh, in terms of health, but also in terms of the economic impact. And many of the things we might think about in terms of human public health will have significant effects on the agricultural sector. And that's going to be important when we think about the broader impacts, but also when you think about who may be your uh, collaborators in pursuing some of these policies and strategies and who actually might not quite like them so much. And that's also important to consider when you're thinking about control and prevention strategies. Who's going to sit where in this, um, in this context? So we have that as important. I'm reminded of a, and the apocryphal story when I was in Toronto just after the SARS outbreak and a public health official declaring that SARS was the best thing ever to happen to public health, meaning that's because it got on the economic agenda and that's what got us a shed load more money than we had before SARS when our budget was going down and down and down year after year. So it's important, these wider um, impacts. Second point is that often the economic impact is not so much the disease itself, the death and disability that's caused by that disease, but the reaction to it. And that can be at an individual level. So if you think of uh, pandemic influenza, avian influenza, which David mentioned, there might be individual behavior, reducing your social mixing, the public transportation use, staying away from work for a few weeks, and all those will have impacts that are economic as well as epidemiological, but also if you keep going up there to how states react, how do states react to SARS, to the travel advisories from WHO when that happened, what happened to the um, pork export sector in Mexico when we had swine flu. Um, public health emergencies, infectious disease especially, are a tremendously good way of uh, introducing trade restrictions and trade sanctions in an ever-increasing globalised, liberalised world where there are few legitimate excuses for trying to restrict trade. And public health emergencies are one, and so they're very popular amongst trade officials. And speaking of this august institution is something we might want to pick up. The third point is then just about some of the possible solutions and how economics can contribute to that. I mentioned looking at the sort of the winners and losers and whose position where on the particular agenda. But some of the things we think about in terms of control and prevention, the classics around surveillance, sharing information, uh, virus sharing, um, travel restrictions or advisories, the things in the international health regulations. Many of these things are for the common good, or as economists would put it, are public goods, and they are global public goods. And the classic global public good effectively is infection or um, communicable disease control. 
And how do you secure these things that we know will benefit everybody, but you have an incentive not to contribute to the production of them? Because as long as everybody else does it, you can benefit from it without paying anything to it at all. And that's actually the crux of a lot of this at the international level, and again, in this institution might be something we want to pick up, which economics has a lot to contribute to through this framework of global public goods for health. How can we secure individual contribution to what will effectively benefit the public in a global sense? Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Muslim, thank you. Um, so I thought I'd uh, crystallize some of these broad principles that David and uh, Richard have brought up uh, using a sort of specific example. And the one I chose was Rift Valley Fever. Now, Rift Valley Fever is a very good example to highlight some of these, uh, some of the issues raised. <coughs> Again, going back into, into the history of it, Rift Valley Fever was first um, identified following an outbreak in, in Naivasha, um, which, is in, which is in the Rift Valley, uh, Rift Valley in Kenya, in 1931. And this was an outbreak on a, on a 30,000 acre farm just north of the lake, uh, which was populated by um, large numbers of merino sheep. Now, you'd, you might ask, what are merino sheep doing in Kenya in 1931? And that's, and that's where the, that's where the, that's, that's what's interesting in this. In, from, from about the mid 19th century, large numbers of naive, um, uh, susceptible uh, livestock breeds were being imported into into um, East Africa and Southern Africa from Europe, and so the virus was able to amplify in these naive populations, and then you s started to see large outbreaks um, in in the animal populations as well as then in in human populations. Um, and with Rift Valley fever, you would get these abortion storms where all the pregnant animals within uh, Within a, within a particular herd would abort their fetuses, and um, by exposure to um, animal material, humans would then also get uh, infected. And in, in around 1%, you would have severe symptoms and death. Now, this, of course, then uh, spurred interest in the virus and uh, interest in um, control strategies. And for a while, that, was, that progressed in a, in a sensible sort of way. There was uh, a, a vaccine was produced, the Smithburn vaccine in the 40s, which was quite effective uh, in controlling the disease in animal populations. But at the same time, we started to see a parallel development um, in interest in the virus from the biosecurity side, side, of, um, side of things. So, so it, it got selected as a potential um, agent for the United States Biological uh, Weapons Program, which was then subsequently closed in 1969, and then more recently in 2002, following the events of 9-11, it, it got put on a list of uh, potential bio biological uh, bioterrorism agents, um, so select agents. And similarly, that it, the, the virus got put onto the list in the UK as well. And so what were the consequences of these two sort of parallel uh, control stra strategies? One focused around um, control of the virus in in, uh, in in the real morbidity and mortality that it causes in some of these impoverished communities, and one around the theoretical risk uh, of bioterrorism, or or what was later, um, or what later developed into the theoretical risk of agroterrorism, because it was it was deemed, and and uh, I think there's this wide consensus now that it's not a good agent for for as a human bioterrorism agent, but it's. But there's this theoretical risk around agricultural bioterrorism. So I think you, you started to see a, f a shift in focus and a shift in resources um, into which control strategy was uh, being adopted. And I think this is, this is where, where we come in, where, uh, where it's sort of our role to, to advocate for public health principles, which are around promoting uh, social justice and reducing inequalities and to try to reorient and realign control strategies to focus on these um, impo impoverished communities where you have huge outbreaks causing um, a large amount of morbidity and mortality and also the indirect co consequences of um, disrupted economic activity. A, a very good example with Rift Valley fever was Somalia was, um, was the biggest exporting port of um, human livestock um, uh, of 
sorry, not human livestock, <laughs> but, small, but small ruminants. Uh, and, and the port of Berbera in 1997 was, even, even at the height of the Civil War, was exporting about 2.8 million animals every year. Um, and you had this Rift Valley fever outbreak, and uh, Saudi Arabia banned the import of uh, livestock from, from East Africa, and that decimated the trade. And within 16 months, they'd lost about $109 million. And for a country um, in the grip of civil war where 65% of uh, uh, GDP is, is, a, is through the livestock industry, that has a huge impact. And you could argue that that was one of the econ economic drivers driving people to take part in the civil war itself. So here you have, so here you have uh, real morbidity and real uh, disease um, driving conflict uh, and, and not being thought of or controlled uh, in that way, but, uh, but the focus being on the theoretical risk, which, uh, which probably, well, in my opinion, would probably not be realized given it's such a poor candidate as a bioterrorism agent in the first place. Okay, so, yeah, thank you very much, Osman. Um, Armand. Thank you. When I told my wife last night that I was going to come and talk to you all about saving lives in an Ebola outbreak, she said, uh, saving lives is not the same thing as saving the patient, which is true as a general matter in outbreak control, but true in a complicated way in Ebola. So I'll, I'll explain. Uh, Ebola is caused by human-to-human -human transmission, and there's no source control. There's no common point for the outbreak, and so there will be no Jon Snow moment of somebody marching down to Broad Street and removing the pump handle from the, uh, well, the bats in this case. Um, we have to interrupt transmission from human to human, and our preferred way of doing this is to bring the cases into the treatment unit, which we no longer call the isolation unit for reasons I'll make clear. Uh, there we are able to care for the patient in a safe way. We wear the complicated protective equipment you see on the television. But we do care for the patient. We don't have a magic bullet to uh, treat Ebola with. That's some years away, unfortunately. But we do treat secondary infections. We do treatment of symptoms. We provide nutritional support. And we provide uh, cardiovascular support to block the shock light state that seems to be why these patients die. In so doing, we reduce the chance of death somewhere between 5 and 15 percent, depending on how generous you're feeling. Uh, which is something, but when you're starting off with a chance of death of anywhere from 50 to 90 percent, depending on the species of Ebola we're talking about, it's not very dramatic. Nevertheless, one would think that a rational person would try to maximize their chance of survival and come to the treatment unit. But the people in these populations know something that you don't. Uh, we, MSF, are brought there at the behest of political organizations that do not always help uh, keep the best interest of the rural African community at mind. Uh, they don't know that we come to spread Ebola and not control it, that we come at the behest of the drug companies that ask us to maximize their profits, and that we are there to steal the organs of the deceased for sale on the black market here. Uh, these rumors and others like them are currently circulating in Guinea, just as they did before in Angola, just as they did before in Gabon, just as they did before in the Republic of Congo. We have a marketing problem. Our best response to this marketing problem is to produce good advocates, uh, survivors, who can say and bear witness to what goes on inside the treatment units, to tell everyone that we do have their best interests at heart, that we are trying to save people. Uh, the problem is, in order to have survivors, you need patients. And in order to get patients, you need survivors. So unfortunately, we're caught in a catch-22. Uh, so how do we end up in this position? Well, you only get one chance to make a first impression, and I think as a, as a general matter, we, we miss this opportunity. We get off on the wrong foot pretty much in each and every outbreak. And I don't know that getting off on the right foot would resolve all of our problems, but we certainly cause a number of them. And this happens because Ebola outbreak control is a complex matter. You have to set up the treatment unit to take care of the cases. You have to uh, come up with a way to safely bury the dead. You have to disinfect the houses that they're coming from. You have to do the anthropological research that will inform the health promotion. You have to do the health promotion. You have to set up a surveillance network so you can detect cases. You have to investigate these cases to find out why they're getting sick and with whom they're in contact. 
you have to set up a contact tracing system so that everybody with whom they're in contact can be followed up for 21 days. You have to set up a laboratory that will allow you to tell who has Ebola and who does not. Uh, and it goes on from there. There are several other supporting activities as well. Uh, and we have a large number of organizations that undertake these activities. Uh, MSF is just one of them. Uh, for a lot of these organizations, it's their first Ebola outbreak. This is not a common occurrence. And this is where the problem lies, that our big problem in controlling Ebola is not that we're dealing with a highly pathogenic virus. It's that we're asking a lot of institutions to do something with which they have very little experience to do it well and get it right uh, so that everybody can profit from the work of everyone else. And this requires very good coordination. And this has been our biggest failing each and every outbreak. Um, the organization that has the mandate to provide this uh, coordination is the World Health Organization, but the World Health Organization has several institutional barriers that make this recurringly and repeatedly uh, a problem. Thank I'll leave you. it there. Thank you very much, Roman. I'm sure that will generate a few questions and a little bit more discussion on that, that topic. So thank you very much. That's uh, that was really comprehensive and, and also um, kept the time. And we'll we'll now open this up for um, open this up for questions. But if I can ask all of you, if you could indicate, um, put your hand up, make sure you have a roving uh, uh, microphone when you're ready to speak, and if you could just stand up and say who you are and what institute you represent, that would be just brilliant. Um, and keep your questions as snappy as possible. That would be even more wonderful. So thank you very much indeed. And it looks like we have a first question right here. Thank you very much. Um, Emma Ross from the Center on Global Health Security at Chatham House. Um, I wanted to ask um, on the coordination question, um, is it a similar situation in humanitarian disasters in, as in outbreaks? And are there any organizations, if not WHO, that could take this on, or are there any suggestions or any moves afoot to look for a solution? Great. Yes and no. Uh, in humanitarian disasters, you have the same problem in that you have a multiplication of organizations. Uh, experience with humanitarian disasters is probably more broad than it is with Ebola. There are a lot of recurring uh, players in the humanitarian disaster that have some co institutional competence, whereas with Ebola, you have less of that. Large-scale humanitarian disasters have a bigger problem with scale. You have anywhere from, you have scores of organizations as opposed to a dozen or so. Um, I don't know who else has the mandate outside of the World Health Organization except the local government. If you have a local governmental agency that has uh, the wherewithal to provide good coordination, they would uh, also have the mandate, and they may well do it. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, most countries don't have repeated ex experience with large-scale disasters, just as very few countries have repeated experience with Ebola outbreaks. The ones that do, Uganda and the DRC coming to mind, uh, tend to do a better job of it. David, can I ask if you've got some comments on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that there's a, a fund out in uh, California, the Skoll Global Threats Fund, which has supported Chatham House, the center here, to try to understand why, in certain instances, the World Health Organization is not able to do the coordination that it should. And there's been a, a study that's been conducted by some very senior um, government officials and others, which will be released actually the 24th of this month in Geneva, and it will be also on the Chatham House website, which tells some of the structural difficulties at WHO and proposes some possible changes that could maybe make a difference. But it is a very difficult issue because the World Health Organization has a regional director in six different regions that's elected by local ministers of health in that region. And then the organization as a whole has a separate elected director general who's elected by all those people from the six regions together. And so there really is no allegiance except that allegiance which can be built build up by team building within the organization, which is very time consuming and hard to do. Great. Also, do you want to say something? However, just, just to be fair as well, um, since, at least on the humanitarian disaster side, since the 2004 Asian tsunami, there's, there's been a UN, uh, UN OCHA 
uh, so an office for the co coordination of humanitarian affairs, which does, which has been improving the way coordination's uh, been working for large scale disasters. And within that, you, you've got uh, clusters. So WHO will lead the health cluster. You'll have a, um, a UNICEF leading the uh, wash, uh, water, and sanitation cluster. So, so there's a cluster mechanism now which has been steadily evolving since 2005, which has improved matters. I think MSF is an observer, has a <laughs> 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 it, but doesn't, but doesn't, uh, uh, is, isn't a cluster member. I think that's, that's, that's a work in progress, and, and it, is, it is improving, especially on the identifying need side of, uh, of uh, humanitarian uh, disasters. There, there are less... It's less good on the on the ser on mapping service provision because it doesn't take into account a lot of um, local service providers and, and and organizations that are not part of the cluster. So so, so you get an uh, incomplete picture. But it but the, there is a mechanism there now within the UN system that, that is improving this. Great. So improving. Amelie, you wanted to ask uh, and quickly, add one more point to to the extent that an anecdote adds to the collective data. In Haiti, uh, when I was setting up, a, I was actually with the CDC at the time, setting up a surveillance system in the displaced persons camps. I was wondering where all of the people I knew from Geneva who had done this before were. And, well, they'd all gone home some weeks prior to that because the folks from PAHO more or less said, we don't need you here. And these regional office Geneva conflicts also occur in Ebola outbreaks. The, the competence for Ebola is concentrated in Geneva, but the mandate is in the regional office and they don't play nicely together. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Next question. So, gentlemen, <coughs> over there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, William Burns for the Society for General Microbiology. Um, I guess that what the panel have just discussed has sort of got to what I wanted to ask was why um, MSF uh, led, uh, very publicly seemed to have led on this particular outbreak. Um, I guess the question I wanted to ask the panel to reflect on is what implications does this kind of structure have for, for example, the preservation of expertise and continuity through time if independent organizations are taking the lead at various points? How is that going to work? Thanks. Great, thank you very much indeed. So, um, Armand, do you want to start with that one? Well, I can, I can. Again. Talking from personal experience, when I started in uh, Gulu in 2000, that was MSF's first entry into the clinical management environment. We had done infection control in, in Kikwit in 95, but we hadn't actually started managing of patients. And WHO was present at the time, and WHO was managing patients uh, at that time. And then, I don't know if the funding dried up or the, the political will disappeared, but they disappeared, from, and MSF was the only organization that would repeatedly show up and take on patient management. There's not a lot of people that really want to put their hands on Ebola patients. Um, and for whatever reason, the, the interest in getting involved in clinical management has resurfaced in Geneva. And so there has been a, an influx of WHO sort of Gorn contractor physicians that came in and worked alongside MSF in the recent outbreak. Uh, mostly in Conakry because People in Conakry said, WHO, you're here because this is where all the politicians are and this is where everybody's focus is. But as things are closing down in Conakry now, they're starting to turn their focus to Gekadu. So I don't know how long they will maintain this interest in clinical management, but they, it, they have returned to the field. Okay, thank you very much. So, David, do you want to add about yeah, why just, MSF? Yeah, I just say there's a real structural issue in the way foreign development assistance is given. Because even if an organization such as MSF or WHO or any organization wants to prepare, help countries prepare for outbreaks, that funding is very difficult to get because the structure of foreign and humanitarian aid is not until after the event occurs, which is very difficult because then it's difficult to maintain funding after that to continue to prepare for the next one. And that's where some, I think, CDC from Atlanta does, in certain instances, stay on and help develop some stronger surveillance systems or detection systems. But in general, there's a structural issue with foreign development aid in that it's not made readily available for preparedness. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Question from the um, lady in the cream jacket. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Sally Leavesley uh, from New Risk Limited. My field is catastrophic risk. I was wondering if anyone is doing any modelling on the risk both inside Syria and to the region from emerging infectious disease and including any potential for biofeedstock, either accidentally or non-accidentally, being mixed with the population. I'm thinking of things like smallpox, plague. Great. Thank you very much. David, yeah, I, I can only say that it's very difficult to determine whether or not any country has infectious agents that it's going to use at some point in time. We've seen what happens when assumptions are made. But to really understand this issue, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a very difficult issue to understand, as Osmond said. So whether or not smallpox is, is outside the laboratories where it's known to be present is really not known by anyone except those who have the organisms. So it's very difficult to be prepared for such issues. And in, in places like Syria, which is the current issue, we do know that, that when refugees and internally displaced persons congregate, infectious diseases do crop up, as has polio. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of just being sure that there's good, if a country has good health care and good systems before an event occurs, many times those systems will carry it through, other times they won't. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just pick up on something that was said earlier, which is about the One Health Initiative? Um, I wonder if, if any of the panel could just say a little bit more about that. Richard? Uh, well, okay, I, kinda, I did. I did raise it. <laughs> <laughs> just so um, we all understand. Uh, okay, so One Health, trying to um, look at the fact that a lot of, as David started to indicate, a lot of the new and emerging infectious diseases are focused on animal-human interface. Therefore, what we would we'll try to seek is to look at uh, interventions, policies that are going to be of benefit to both systems, health and agriculture, and particularly look at those where there may not be, because that's going to be an issue to try to implement. So if one takes an example, I guess, antimicrobial resistance would be a good one, because we have for many years discussions in the human health environment that actually this isn't a human health issue, it's the fact that these farmers are pushing millions of tons of these things into animals as growth promoters, as well as prophylactic and, and anti-infectives, and they should solve that. The animal health people saying, well, of course, if we use them here, there's no evidence to suggest that that generates resistance in humans, and you have this conflict. Actually, both or, um, groups there stand to benefit from the maintenance of effective antibiotics for treatment of animals and humans. And you start from that point of view and look to see what policies can actually harmonize and bring together those two groups, because then together we can start to solve this. If we maintain a system where they're potentially fighting against each other, then, uh, then we won't. And certainly that interest in, in pursuing issues that are relevant to both does seem to be hitting the agenda more and more. So we have... Uh, we have a centre in London called Leverheim Centre for Integrative Research on Agriculture and Health, which Leverheim have put a lot of money into research on those two, uh, bringing those two areas under one health. You have various initiatives brought under the antimicrobial resistance. So the Research Councils UK are now effectively being mandated to look at their, um, their, their, their affiliations around social sciences or medical sciences or animal sciences, biological. What are they doing in their constituencies to tackle this issue? So then you're bringing the disciplines together. And in all cases, you're trying to pull down the silos, either disciplinary or the sectoral silos between agriculture uh, and health, which will benefit a number of areas. And again, kind of in a sense, brings you back to this global public good issue of looking for things that are going to win across a number of areas simultaneously, because then you can mobilize a lot more uh, capital on the financial sense, but also capital in experience, political capital, the capital will come through if you can hit a number of constituencies rather than just one and potentially just fighting another one, because that will get us nowhere. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Next question. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Stevenson from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of Liverpool. Um, I'm glad the previous speaker uh, mentioned the word risk, because I'm conscious that it is in our title, Measuring the Risk. I'm also conscious um, that in this country, we've done this rather badly, at least in the initial stages of the BSE crisis and possibly in the foot and mouth disease crisis. Uh, I think we did rather better in the recent outbreaks of Blue Tongue and uh, Schmallenberg. 
um, and uh, our experience with swine flu, the global experience of swine flu, I think, with David and David sitting here, I, I won't comment, but it was, bit, it was a little mixed, and I don't think the Americans did that well with West Nile. So I was just wondering um, if on the, on the platform or maybe um, in the audience, um, looking at how we have successfully or unsuccessfully estimated risk for emerging infections in the past, if there are some general lessons which will help us to do it better in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, question about um, estimating risk, but maybe also considering communicating risk as well. Um, David, do you want to start yeah, off? With? I'll start off. You know, epidemiological modeling can give us an idea of what might happen. And as you know, when you do epidemiological modeling, you put in what you know or what you believe you know about a disease, and the model generates what might happen. The problem with models is they're estimates. They have nothing to do with reality. They're estimates based on a set of presumptions. But when they fall into the hands of the politicians, they become fact. And that's, or in the hands of irresponsible journalists. And so that's the real issue that occurs is estimates are made. They're qualified by the modelers who make those estimates, but then they fall into hands which, which manipulate them in some way or another, and they end up in exaggerating the situation. Richard, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, um, my first point is going to sound really pedantic, but a difference between risk and uncertainty. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here is uncertainty. If there's risk, actually that's quantitative, and actually you can deal with that relatively straightforwardly. Uncertainty is hugely difficult to deal with, as the climate change people, for example, know only too well. And we face in terms of antimicrobial resistance and also in many of these other, where is, somewhere, where is something going to emerge from? So pandemic influenza, focus on Asia, it's bound to happen, it's going to be Mexico. You know, that kind of uncertainty is much more difficult and politicians and the media hate it because you're basically saying we don't know. But let's try, for example, and be very precautionary because that seems a sensible thing to do, but that's not a good message. Uh, the second point I was going to make, so that sounds a bit pedantic, but I think it's actually quite real. So it gets to my point about a lot of, from the economist's point of view, the impact isn't the disease, it's the behaviours. And a lot of that is about what you understand by how risky is this to me as an individual or to me as a country of, of getting this and dealing with it, etc. And a lot of, when we looked at um, preparedness plans for pandemic influenza particularly, preparedness plans are around NHS, uh, doctors, nurses, etc. If you talk to the Bank of England and the Treasury, their plans and what they want to deal with is how do we keep people doing what they're doing in the economy? How do I keep the security guard going to the building so it can open for business? How do I keep the transport drivers taking petrol tankers to petrol stations? And that's about communication of the risk and uncertainty and what it means at all sorts of levels from an individual through to a state, which I agree with you, we haven't done very well because it's not given the priority. The priority is the pure epidemiology, which is important uh, but it's not the whole picture. Great, thank you. Osman, do you want to comment and, on that? Just to yeah. maybe illustrate that point, um, I think the, the trouble really is in predicting how um, the media and, and wider society is going to perceive that risk. So MERS coronavirus is a, is a, is a very good example of that, um, particularly within the context of, of where the outbreak's happening right now in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't remember the exact word in Arabic, but if you, but when, when they first communicated the risk, the perception was because, was because of the word, the, the, simply the word they selected, that it was like a plague-like outbreak. In, uh, and so it, it started conjuring up these images of uh, you know, um, medieval plagues sweep, sweeping across cities and uh, decimating communities. And, and that was the sort of language that was um, circulating on social media and in, in the newspapers. <coughs> and from a global perspective, I think WHO probably did a fairly good job in it's not become a public health emergency of international concern. And they've, they've waited for the actual evidence to emerge from the laboratories in Germany, which have shown, for instance, that the, that the virus hasn't changed. It's not, it's, it's transmissibility is the same as it was previously, and it's, uh, it's got low mortality. So, um, so, so I think, yes, what we're, what we're not good at is communicating the risk or anticipating how it's going to be perceived by the public, and the choice of that language is, I think that's the whole specialty in all, all in its own. 
Does anybody want to pick up on communicating risk and improving on that a little bit more? <coughs> <laughs> I know that uh, MSF got into a spat earlier because of the choice of outbreak versus epidemic or something rather pointless like that. Um, and, or the, another one was the use of the word unprecedented. I, I think well, it, that's interesting as well because that has in implications in terms of insurance as well. So if, if, you, if, if it's classified as an epidemic, then insurance companies don't have to pay uh, so, in, so in a lot of circumstances okay. for, for the for the healthcare of uh, affected people, yeah. whereas if it's just an outbreak, they they still do. So Great. how did they come to that conclusion? <laughs> That's just bizarre. Okay, let's move on and get an, another que another question. Thank you very much, gentlemen in the front. I'm a student at London School of Hygiene. Um, I was just wondering what is different about this outbreak, and uh, can it teach us anything about the future of Ebola? And I've seen a lot of things in the press, but I would like to know from you guys. Great. So we'll, if Arnold could take that first. Uh, well, the most new thing about it is an outbreak of Ebola, Zaire, in Guinea. Uh, at first, people, when we heard the first stories, uh, the people in the know said, oh, this is Lhasa. But then the clustering was a bit wrong, and it kind of looked more like a phylovirus. So then maybe it's the Thai forest to come back. And no, it was Zaire. And I thought, well, how the heck did it get all the way over there? And then the guys from Hamburg uh, went and sequenced the genes and said there's about 3% genetic variation such that they can run the clock back enough to say that this is something that evolved in a parallel way and has been there or in the neighborhood for quite some time. It wasn't something that walked over recently from uh, the Congo, um, which probably means that it's been there all along. Uh, we've just been missing it or it hasn't uh, gotten into the human population. Maybe it's a low risk of transmission and once it happens, humans are good at developing enough viremia to cause uh, sustained transmission. So. For example, if getting the disease from a bat is a low-risk event, all it takes is one, and then you've got a human amplifier of, of the virus. Um, other than that, I don't know. We won't know yet what it means. Uh, it looks like the case, fat, case fatality ratio may be a bit lower, but we won't know until the end. And whether we can take credit for that or it's part of the virus or it's something about the folks in Guinea, uh, you know, we can argue about, but no one will ever know, really. Can I pick up with David. So could we talk a little bit more about that in terms of prevention and preparedness? I mean, Ebola won't go away. It's likely we're going to see it again and again. So can we, can we have a little bit more in terms of how we can prepare, prevent, think about the environment, etc.? You know, I think the first thing to understand is that if Ebola, the Ebola virus wants to become a disease which is present in human populations in a sustainable manner, it has to become less virulent because now it's its own worst enemy if it wants to do that. It's too virulent to sustain its transmission. But we do know from studies that were done between 1980 and 1985 that Ebola emerges periodically into human populations, but in most instances it doesn't cause an outbreak because it doesn't get into a situation that Arno described where transmission is amplified, either by unsterile needles or by poor hospital practices. So Ebola will be with us. In fact, it's a member of the filiform uh, virus family, and there are many different filiform viruses, including Marburg virus, and many that are probably asymptomatic. Because if you look at any one population living in the Congo Basin in sub-Saharan Africa, you'll find that there are antibodies to filoviruses in those populations. They're closely exposed to animals, but mostly it's probably not Ebola. It's another member of that family. Ebola also exists in the Philippines, as you know, in a, in a form that isn't virulent in humans. It doesn't cause human illness, yet it does cause animal illness, and primates die from the disease. So there are many different strains of Ebola, and I think it's just beginning to be understood what those strains really mean. So also in terms of prevention and amplification, yeah. I wonder if we could just um, explore a little bit um, more about this aspect of kind of patient safety and the delivery of, of mm -hmm. safe health care. Um, and um, I wonder if you could have a uh, Well, it was, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about Marburg is that usually we don't see much person-to-person -person transmission. Usually you get some secondary and a few tertiary cases, but usually these are common source outbreaks. People go into a gold mine, they go into a cave where they're exposed to the, the primary reservoir. The exception was Angola in 2005. We have no idea what the source was, but the Angolans did something, we have our suspicions, uh, very effective to transfer uh, the virus between each other, and they got the case fatality ratio up to 90% or so. Um, the, the assumption is that this was 
reuse of needles and the fact that healthcare workers like to go home and had second jobs out of their back doors selling unofficial vaccines or treatments and the like, uh, which would be a very good explanation. And uh, there was a comment made that Angola's problem with Marburg was that they didn't have a pre-existing problem with HIV, that had they had HIV, they would have had better habits and Marburg would have never really gotten off the ground there. Uh, again, that's an anecdote, but uh, illustrative. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Any questions from over this side of the room? Are we over there? Gentleman over there in the second row, thank you very much. Uh, Nicholas Easton, UCL. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel what they thought about how it was possible to measure the appropriateness of responses to uncertain illnesses compared to infectious diseases you can be relatively certain about year on year, like hepatitis B or hepatitis C, which kill hundreds of thousands of people annually across the world. Okay, great. Osmond, do you want to start on that one? Um, well, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's... it's it, it, uh, it's a difficult thing to do with uh, with uh, periodic with periodic outbreaks, um, but I think uh, many of the development agencies that that, that that do have programs have a component built into them uh, where they where they try to do some ongoing evaluation and uh, research around the work. So I'm, I'm sure MSF is doing something around evaluation and research with this current outbreak. Well, yeah, probably should be doing more. The problem is that. Uh, Ebola catches you off guard each time. I mean, that's the when you have something that's a more stable threat, you can have an ongoing response to it. But as soon as Ebola goes away, all of the normal things return, and we sort of know what the return on our investment is for vaccines and for all of our other work. I mean, we do maintain some some work with Ebola, but it, it you know, you just you want to be better prepared each time, and you say, I'm going to get this done, and as soon as the outbreak's over you're back to working on the normal stuff again, which is the thing that causes more disease more of the time. So uh, our response to Ebola is disproportionate. Uh, I don't know that our research agenda will catch up with that, but... Uh, Great. David, a few comments on that, and then we'll yeah. have another question. Just to say, when, when, a new, when you're faced with a new organism, what happens is you have to try to relate it to something you already know. For example, when mad cow occurred here in the UK, there was a comparison to Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in humans and, and Kuru in, in humans, other similar diseases. And what happened was precautionary measures were put in place. Those are the most stringent recommendations as to how to prevent infection. Even though you don't have evidence, you put down the most stringent recommendations. As the evidence begins to come in, then you can modify those recommendations. And that's what, what Rich was talking about, about precautionary measures in flu. When you put out those initial precautionary measures, it's because you don't have any more evidence than, than you, you don't have the evidence you need to make more tailor-made recommendations. Managing that uncertainty. Thank you very much. So, so um, any questions over here? I'm missing out this one. Okay. Um, gentleman in the second row there, thank you very much. Um, Derek Gregory, retired from the National Institute of Medical Research in the Department of Leprosy and Tuberculosis Research. A um, uh, couple of uh, quick snappy questions. Um, is the Ebola virus any different than any other virus in terms of the success of its infectivity to individuals? For example, um, the higher the uh, a level of living in an individual, the better, the higher the quality of the immune system will be. Conversely, uh, um, the lower uh, the quality of living, such as those in uh, the Africas, the greater the inf success of the infectivity will be. Um, uh, and also, uh, what's the present situation in terms of research to produce a vaccine. I understand you've just said that uh, research is going on or investigations are going on to the nature of the Ebola. Well, what's the present situation in the uh, laboratories? Finish. Great, thank you very much. Can we start with the last one? Well, first? the last about one's the easier one yeah. to go to. Um, so there are several vaccine candidates, the most promising of which the vesicular stomatitis vaccine which works very well in non-human primates, has yet to go into phase one trials. It used to just exist in a couple of laboratory batches. It's now been passed to a pharmaceutical company that's produced a, 
a GMP batch that they would like to get into phase one trial shortly. Uh, it sort of is the recurring favorite post-exposure prophylaxis when we go through the horror stories of what will happen if some healthcare worker sticks himself with a needle in front of us. Do we have something we can do about that? Uh, and the VSV uh, vaccine works rather well within 24 hours of exposure uh, and was used one time for an accidental exposure in Hamburg, Germany. It did not result in infection. We don't know if it was an infective dose or not. Uh, there is an adenovirus vaccine that actually went through phase one trials but probably got put in a drawer. We never heard about it because they used adenovirus 5 and they think that there was a, pre -existing, a problem with pre-existing immunity. People were inactivating the vaccine. Um, other things that are going on, there's uh, siRNAs that are in, first, uh, in phase one trials that completed single dose trials and they're working on their way towards multi-dose trials. Those also seem to be relatively effective within 24, 48 hours, maybe even 72 hours post-exposure. The most exciting uh, treatment that's out there though are the monoclonal antibodies. These are actually working already in animals who are sick. We're talking day four of illness when the animals are already febrile and losing weight. Uh, we are pulling monkeys back from uh, clinical illness, which is the only time we've ever done that. Uh, those are now available in some lots, uh, and when they'll go into trials, I have no idea. But we're going to get to the point where the epidemic space is going to be shared with drug companies that want to run clinical trials, and that will be an interesting moment because given the current suspicion that they have of the already... Uh, nefarious disease control outbreaks, they'll feel even better about us when we show up with the actual drug companies they've been talking about who want to run experiments on them. Great. Thank you very much indeed. I think um, we might move on to the next question, if that's all right, because you've only got a few minutes to spare. Thank you very much. Uh, microphone front, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm David Harper. I've got a role at the moment as a senior consulting fellow here at Chatham House. First, I'd like to thank you all for your uh, excellent introductory comments and the, uh, the interesting points that have been made so far. Um, I think all of you have mentioned the um, issue of preparedness and prevention in different ways. I think you've all touched on that. Uh, and the message seems to be that this is the way to go that uh, it's quite a cost-effective way to deal with some of the emerging infectious diseases, to shift the balance more onto prevention and pre preparedness than onto uh, response and recovery come to that. That message doesn't seem to be getting across very well to the risk managers, the ministers, the funding agencies. So I wonder if you had to give one killer message to the risk managers uh, to be able to help facilitate that shift towards preparedness and prevention, what would be the killer message? Great, thank you. Give? I'm going to ask Richard to answer that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. Forget killer to the, answer. Before get to the killer message, I think there's a difference between prevention and preparedness. I think that prevention is about literally what it says, which is stopping this thing happening. I think preparedness is saying it is going to happen. If all is going to come out again, something we haven't thought of will emerge somewhere and cause some of these similar things. How we prepare to deal with it when it happens. We don't know at what point, how big it will be, where it will be, but what's the system in place for that? Which I think is different to prevention. And I think prevention's got a long history of struggle along the, the health promotion kind of people. You know, that cure prevention issue is, is ongoing within a system, let alone across. I think preparedness is quite a new thing and is a thing, in a sense, the environmentalists have had to deal with in terms of climate change. When do you try to stop it by getting us to reduce all emissions? And when do you say, actually, we need to adapt? I think preparedness is a bit like that in terms of it's almost adapting to the fact we will have these things. How are we going to deal with it when it comes out? And that's the issues about what's our surveillance system like? So how fast can we know what this thing is? All the way through to what happens if a country says, help, I've got something here that's emerging and is likely to be important. And we're back to the public health issues, emergency uh, 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 international concern, because that's where the trade barriers hit. So you've got those levels to get out. So I think the, the key thing is, is actually what preparedness is and getting us into that mindset to deal with, not mixing it with prevention and thinking a lot about prevention, but saying whatever we do, how many vaccines we have, something will happen, and we need to be prepared as an international community to deal with it. Which is that killer enough for you? 
not really. It's not snappy it's enough. <laughs> it's not really. snappy enough, okay. I, I, I agree. Can, can, can any of the panel improve on that a little bit? Just in brevity, not clearly in context. So, <laughs> so, so I think uh, capacity building and a, and a one health approach ca can actually work. And, and there, there, there are some practical uh, examples that you can highlight. And again, RVF is a good example. So following this, this, uh, this ban I spoke about earlier from, uh, from, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula to, um, on Somali exports, um, uh, the ban ended in 2009. And what happened after that is you had Saudi investors come to Somalia, to the ports of Berber and Bosaso, and they, they built quarantine facilities there. They, they improved um, export standards up to OIE standards. And that benefited both the importing country as well as, uh, as well as the exporting country. And Somalia is now able to export to a much wider market as well. Um, and okay. so you're preventing things at source. Brevity. Armand, do you want to uh, say very quickly. very quickly? And we're going to squeeze in one more question, but very quickly. Uh, Filovirus diseases come to North America and Europe, and it doesn't propagate because we have good infection control. So what we need is to take good infection control to the places that have to deal with it on a regular basis. Which goes back to the issue we were discussing before about healthcare and patient safety and um, good practice in the healthcare. Question at the front again, and this is going to be last question. Yes. Quick answers. Yeah, Emma Ross again from the center. Um, this is actually kind of brings us around nicely to the end, measuring the risk. Can anyone say what is the risk or the likelihood that Ebola could become another HIV, that, you know, if HIV has been circulating since the turn of the century, 50 years, more than 50 years later we do it, now we see Ebola, could it ever become, go human? Or are there things about the virus that would make that unlikely? So, quick answer to that. Um, I think it's very unlikely. The way Ebola is transmitted is, it's just not going to propagate like HIV. The people are too sick when they're infectious to spread to anybody but their closest contacts who become sick very quickly. You don't, you don't have that nice sort of hidden event that causes transmission. If the virus changes, you know, I have no idea. But what you'd probably see would be a lower pathogenicity in the, in the short run. We'd see it. Uh, but fecal oral d d transmission doesn't, doesn't go global. It, respiratory disease does, sexually transmitted disease does, but waterborne fecal oral doesn't really go global. It tends to stay regional. So I doubt it would go much further. Great. David, do you want a final comment on that? Well, some fecal oral diseases do go global. Polio went global, wow. for example. So, but, but I think that the answer is just what you said on it. If, in fact, this virus should mutate in a way that it becomes less virulent, it could very well become an endemic disease like many other endemic diseases. In fact, if you look at what most medical historians and scientists believe, every human infection that's endemic in humans has at one time or another been in an animal come into humans, establish residence, and continues to transmit in humans. This is just the nature of infections. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed to our excellent panel, and thank you all very much indeed. I've failed in my chairing by going two minutes over, and for my you know, pathetic attempt at trying to read Twitter. I do apologize. <laughs> okay, so thank you all very, very much, and thank you to our panel.